Guys, I love Love, love Sum 41. Sum 41 are a huge band. I've seen Sum 41 in concert a few times. I owned their DVD back in the day. Yes, that's right. Back in the day, you couldn't just type in Sum 41 concert into YouTube. You actually had to go to the store and pay like $20 to get their concert on DVD, man. I love them. Who else remembers being like maybe 10 or 11 or maybe even a teenager and singing along to In Too Deep, The Hell Song, Fat Lip, or one of those big bangers from the early 2000s. And maybe even in their classroom, I remember being in a classroom in the year 2001, it was Christmas time, and the teacher let us play whatever music we wanted as it was the last day before Christmas break. So we all put on Sum 41 and we we're all singing along. Sum 41 were huge, extremely commercially successful, and they headlined the second stage at Download Festival just three years ago. They were part of the same pop punk sort of punk rock boom that happened between the year 2000 and about 2004, which also included Blink-182, Simple Plan, Good Charlotte, Yellow Card. But what I don't understand is why they aren't as big as say Blink-182. I would have thought with their success, with their popularity, with the fact that pretty much everyone my age knows who they are and so many people love their songs and hold them dear to their heart, why aren't they as big as, say, Blink-182? Or even, you could argue, All Time Low, even though All Time Low came onto the scene quite a bit later. When you think of bands who are like at the top of the pop punk and top of the punk rock sort of, I don't know, tier or popularity contest, I guess you could call it, right up at the top, there's Blink-182. They're headlining like Download Festival on the main stage and Reading Festival. Not only that, they are also selling out the O2 Arena and arenas all over America. They have residencies in Las Vegas. Uh, right underneath them, you've got All Time Low also selling out arenas. Fall Out Boy selling out arenas and playing at festivals. They're not just liked by fans of rock and punk and pop punk music. They're also liked by just completely normal people, a little bit more than some 41. When I think of Sum 41 and the venues they play, yes, they have headlined some festivals, but for the most part, they're more likely to play at Brixton Academy, it's a, maybe a ballroom, a, a, a big venue, but a smaller venue when compared to somewhere like Wembley Arena, for example. And the question on my mind and that I've seen on the internet is on a lot of other people's minds is why aren't they as popular as Blink-182? I'm gonna use Blink-182 as the reference point here because those other bands I mentioned, they came onto the scene a little bit later. Some of them are around the same sort of level of popularity as Sum 41, but I would say that Blink-182 are like the, they're like the mothership. They're like the top of the pyramid and then all these other bands are sort of trickling out in their little ships underneath. That doesn't make any sense at all, does it? So let's delve into some of the reasons why this could be. Why aren't Sum 41 as big as Blink-182, for example? Reason number one is pretty obvious. Blink-182 had a two or three year head start. Not only did they become a band a few years earlier, but their big singles, their breakout singles, What's My Age Again and All The Small Things, they were both released in, I believe, 1999, two years before Sum 41 broke out with Fat Lip and In Too Deep. And also before this, even though Sum 41 had Half Hour of Power, which is an amazing album, it didn't really have any bangers, you could say, that were really charting and making it onto mainstream radio, whilst Blink-182 already had Dude Ranch, which had Damn It on it, and also Josie. It already had some songs which were sort of out there, and they were heavily touring with bands like Goldfinger and Green Day. Blink-182 sort of rode this wave which had already been started by bands like The Offspring and Green Day. So in the early 90s, there was The Offspring, there was Green Day, this sort of punk rock movement. That wave was going, 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 and Blink-182 hopped on that wave right before it sank into the ocean and a new wave began. Blink-182 were riding on that success wave of The Offspring and by the time that Sum 41 were already bursting onto the scene, Blink-182 were heavily on the festival circuit and getting a lot of airplay with their songs. So it's almost like Sum 41 got sort of sidekicked. They became sidekicked as this sort of wannabe, not wannabe Blink-182, but like, you know, just like the next Blink-182, the same way that sort of Busted came out and then the band McFly came out, or sometimes some big rapper like Eminem will come out and then some other small rappers came out over the 2001 to 2007 sort of era. 
uh, which weren't as commercially successful. Not only this, but around the time that Sum 41 gained popularity and they had their, the, you know, their first big album, which was All Killer No Filler, but then they had Does It Look Infect, Does This Look Infected a couple of years later. By this time, it was already around 2003, 2004, and that sort of rock music, pop punk, punk rock, rock music scene was beginning to die out in favor of other bands. For example, more kids around this time were, were listening to, I guess you could say, mainstream rock bands like Red Hot Chili Peppers, or they were listening to indie rock. Indie rock was becoming a big thing. You had bands like Arctic Monkeys, Razor Light, and eventually The Kooks, and a lot of the kids on the festival circuits like the Reading Festival, and Coachella, you know, Glastonbury, these big festivals, were more sort of listening to this indie rock and regular rock sort of sound, along with a lot of rap and R&B and the new metal, the Limp Bizkit, the Corn, the Sum 41, the pop punky punk rock was, was slowly declining and eventually kind of Blink-182 right at the top split up in 2004, 2005 anyway. So that's reason number one is the head start. Reason number two is the pandering. What I love about Sum 41 is they've always stayed true to themselves. They don't really seem to care very much about what other people think of them and they always seem to write the music that they want to write. They don't pander to their audience. They don't pander to people. Their music comes from true creative expression. You see, in 2004, when they released the single We're All To Blame and the album Chuck, there weren't really many other bands at the time which were doing this thing. Those bands had sort of moved on and it was beginning to transition from this rock and pop punk and indie rock theme into this more sort of mall emo, mall scene kid sort of scene where bands like Fall Out Boy and My Chemical Romance and Fight Star were starting to emerge. And what happened with the other bands around at the time, they started pandering. So Blink-182 broke up into both Plus 44 and Angels and Airwaves. Now Angels and Airwaves heavily pandered towards their audience. Angels and Airwaves were the a typical sort of like mall emo, mall goth sort of mall punk kind of band. They really pandered to what was going on at the time. Uh, Tom DeLong even had the sort of emo hair. Plus 44 as well. I remember the emos at the time were very, very much into Plus 44 because that album was much more melodramatic and had much more of a heavy emo feel compared to Blink-182. So Mark and Travis and the other two members started writing and producing these songs which were much more emotional and had a lot more angst. Even though Blink-182 are an angsty band, this had a much more angst feel which was very relatable at the time to the sort of emo -y phase that was going on. Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy and My Chemical Romance doing this sort of emotional, rocky, pop punky music, along with bands like Thursday and Taking Back Sunday, those two bands sort of altered their sound. It was much different to the Blink-182 sound and it was pandering to the audience. Uh, you'll notice this with Fall Out Boy when they started. They changed their sound a few years later as well. They kind of started off as the emo-y, pop-punky band. A few years later, it began to become a bit more pop-centered, a bit more Reading Festival, sing-along, everyone in the crowd knows our song, sort of BBC Radio 1 type music. Rather than Sum 41, who were destined to be on the rock radio, such as Kerrang! and Scuzz, these other bands were pandering to their audience, creating sort of more mainstream sing-along things which were popular at the time. You'll notice in recent years, a good example of this is Five Seconds of Summer. Six years ago when Five Seconds of Summer burst onto the scene, they were more of like an all-time low band. They were a four-piece pop-punk, pump punk rock band. Over time, they sort of changed their sound and their last two albums have been more of a synth pop and more radio pop friendly sound, almost similar to kind of like Post Malone or something like that. That sort of like droney vocals mixed with electronic drums and th synthesizers. Sum 41 never did this. Sum 41 never really pandered to their audience. And even when they did, it just seemed to be at the wrong time. That brings me on to point number three is bad timing. I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but in 2007, there was a little bit of turmoil within the band because of creative differences. Guitarist Dave, who was an integ integral part of the songwriting process and a very talented musician, left Sum 41 and they started work on a new album. This album was different again. So they'd started off with this sort of punk rock band and then done a bit of rapping in their music and then they'd gone heavier with their album Chuck and then they'd gone back 
to the pop punk sound in 2007. The problem was they were a bit too late to the party here. As, as I mentioned, because at this time, all of the scene kids and a lot of the uh, kids who are dominating the music scene, the ones buying the records, the one playing the music on YouTube and MySpace at the time, had started listening to different music other than this uppity song. For example, Underclass Hero, one of the lead singles from this album. It debuted, I believe, at number 188 on the UK charts and number 33 on the Canadian charts. So it didn't chart very well. I don't think anyone was really paying attention to it. People weren't giving it attention because it wasn't what was popular at the time. Again, this goes hand in hand with Sum 41 not pandering, but what's brilliant is Sum 41 have built up this huge cult sort of audience. I shouldn't say cult audience, they have an extremely wide audience, but their shows sell out internationally and they have huge crowds come and see them. It's still gonna be good because we love listening to them and we love going to their energetic, epic live shows. If you've been to a Sum 41 show, you know it's just so entertaining. They do covers of Iron Maiden, they get the crowd involved, they'll do like big interludes, they're fantastic musicians. And not only that, they sound so similar live to how they do on the record because they're all very talented, very tight musicians. You can tell that they've really put a lot of work into the rehearsal of their live show. I mentioned briefly earlier about rock radio. Think about radio stations like O-Rock and Kerrang! And now compare that to BBC Radio 1. Let's imagine this, right? It's the year 2003, 2004. You're driving down to the beach with your family. You stick on BBC Radio 1 or Triple J, or whatever is the big radio station in your country. What are you more likely to hear? Are you more likely to hear the Hell song or Still Waiting? We're all to blame. Screaming Bloody Murder. I know that didn't come out till 2011, but whatever. Are you more likely to hear that? Or are you more likely to hear The Rock Show by Blink-182 or Always or I Miss You or maybe After Midnight, one of their more recent songs? It's more likely the radios are gonna give attention to Blink-182 and those other bands with a more poppy sound. Number five, lineup changes and inner turmoil. Now, a couple years after Underclass Hero was released, Blink-182 announced that they were reuniting. And who did they invite to join them on their reunion tour? Why, Fall Out Boy, of course. Now, that's possibly the best PR stunt you could ever possibly do. If you're going out on a big uh, nationwide tour and you've got Fall Out Boy, one of the biggest sort of pop punk, punk rock, and just rock in general bands at the time, the most commercially successful, getting all of this radio play, getting all of this time on the music channels, probably you know getting the most likes on Facebook or most friend requests on MySpace or something like that. Then you've got them and you've also got Weezer as your support act. Oh, and My, Com Chem My Chemical Romance as well, yeah. And they did the Honda Civic tour with My Chemical Romance as well. Like that is like the, the sort of like radio rock or radio pop punk powerhouse right there. Like that is just amazing timing. What they've done is they've recruited like one sort of band from every possible scene there that they could get their hands on. So people are gonna show up to those gigs. Those gigs are going to absolutely sell out. Even people who don't even like Blink-182 are still gonna show up to see Weezer or possibly to see you know one of the other supporting bands, right? Now, I have no doubt that Sum 41 have done this as well themselves. Recently, they went on tour with the Amity Affliction, one of the biggest sort of metalcore rock bands around at this present time. However, Sum 41 were just going through like a good sort of seven years of turmoil, maybe even more. First of all, they had Dave leaving, you know, and he was such an integral part. People loved watching him play. I mean, when you watch him perform live, it's mind blowing. I remember being, I think I was, must have been Reading 2002, Reading 2003, maybe. Maybe Reading 2004? I can't remember, but I was like 11 or 12 years old. I remember watching Dave from Sum 41 playing the guitar solo uh, on the back of his head like that. That was just absolutely amazing to watch. It seemed like there was a lot of inner turmoil going on at the time. They first of all struggled with their next two albums. They were released to mixed reviews from critics, mixed reception, and also the fans just didn't really know what to make of it. Well, we really enjoyed it, we really loved it. It was just, it was, it was more difficult. You didn't know what you were getting. And at the same time, Derek, the singer of Sum 41, 
were struggling, uh, struggling with alcoholism. And I believe they also left their record label at some point. And I do believe that their 2016 album was actually crowdfunded as well. I believe, I think they signed to Hopeless Records, but I'm pretty sure there was some crowdfunding going on for that as well. That sort of inner turmoil, despite the fact that Blink-182 went on a four year hiatus and then came back together, it was all kind of timed perfectly because they went off and they started their own bands. They remained popular, they made, remained relevant by starting those own separate bands. And then when they came back together, it was still like this thing like, oh amazing, they're back together. That band that I loved when I was 11 years old is back together. Now, right, because when Blink-182 broke up in 2004, 2005, all of us were hurting. We're all like, oh my God, wait, even though we've seen them three times, we're not gonna be able to see them again for like another, I don't know, until we die basically. But then they got back together and it gave us this relief. We all became extremely excited again to see them on, in concert, to see them playing on TV, to see them playing on late night TV shows again. We all booked tickets to go to their tour. It almost seemed like it, it worked out perfectly, whereas Sum 41, were struggling internally. They had members leave and then an album not do so well and they were touring relentlessly, but because of albums not doing so well and because of members leaving, Steve Jocks left, I think it was 2013, so another member leaves then. So there was like a, a, a break from touring in 2008, I think it was, or 2009. And then again, there was a break from touring in 2013, 2014, 2015, whilst they're sorting themselves out. You know, they've had the guitarist leave and then their drummer leave. And then the guitarists come back and they want to record a new album. They got to shoot new music videos and then go out for a tour promoting it. It just all felt a little bit up in the air and it was struggling internally a lot. Couple that with Derek's alcoholism and his uh, declining health. Even though Blink-182 have had these, these breakups, they've had people leaving. One of their main songwriters and lead singers, Tom, leave. What they did when Blink-182, I believe it was the end of 2015, when Tom left, they didn't sit around and be like, oh, what are we gonna do next? Oh, how are we gonna write our new album? Immediately, immediately, they just recruited someone else. And even though Matt Skiba has gotten a lot of hate from some of the fans, he's been welcomed pretty reasonably well. I mean, it certainly helps that he had a highly successful career in the band Alkaline Trio for the last 20 to 25 years or so before joining Blink-182. Even though it was a little bit turbulent, they just got on with it. That's the thing. Even though Tom left, you would think that in that instance, that would mean, oh, instant breakup. But that's not what they thought. They didn't think, okay, let's go back to plus 44. They were like, no, we've got something amazing going on here. We've got a huge fan base. We write incredible albums. People still come out to see us headline festivals and to see our shows. When we play What's My Age again, people still get their phones out and film it. People are loving this. Why should we give in? No, recruit another talented member and keep writing good songs. And that's what they've done. Even though the California album, personally, in my opinion, I didn't think was that good and critics were very weary of it. 2019 album nine, I thought was a really great album. It's got a lot of hits on there, a lot of bangers. Some of it's similar to the old stuff. Some of it's poppy, some of it's mainstream. But of course, they're pandering, obviously. They just cracked on, they kept going. Not being the case for Sum 41, it's been a bit up in the air. Oh, member leaves, stop touring. Album doesn't do well. Another member leaves, stop touring. Songwriting. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Sum 41 know how to write a really good song. They are amazing at writing songs. However, when it comes to writing songs, that people really want to hear and that people really love and that people remember and that people remember the melodies of. I would say that Blink-182 are just, they're just perfect for that. And this has actually been heavily discussed on podcasts. If you listen to podcasts with their producer, John Feldman, also the singer of Goldfinger, you'll hear that, you know, he's fascinated by the way that Mark writes songs because Mark writes these really simple melodies, but they're just so catchy. They're so catchy and people remember them and people love singing along to them. He's really good at just creating upbeat, positive, just good pop punk music that people want to hear. However, there's one thing that gets majorly neglected here. One thing gets majorly neglected here, okay? If you look, at the recent albums by bands like Five Seconds of Summer, one of the hugest sort of pop and punk rocky bands around at the moment, and Blink-182's later albums, look at how many ghostwriters there are in the credits, okay? If I got all of those writers, all the songwriters who go into making those albums by Blink-182 and Five Seconds of Summer, and I put them in this room here now, they wouldn't all fit 
or maybe they would, but we'd all be very, very close together. Okay, there's so many songwriters there. Some 41, as far as I know, haven't done that, or they've barely done that. They write all their own songs, and that's very admirable in its own way. Even though they don't chart as well as Blink 182s, so they don't get the airplay that Blink 182's songs get, and they never really have. It's very admirable that they forged this career writing, what, seven or eight incredible, really good albums that I love listening to, and the fans love listening to as well. And this is gonna bring me on to my last point, and that is the fans. Now, Blink 182 fans, are just crazy. Have you ever met a Blink-182 fan and said to them, hey, Blink-182 suck? They freak out and then say to them, Tom DeLong can't sing life. They will freak out. They get so defensive about how much they love Blink-182. Blink-182 have this really dedicated, strong fandom. And Blink-182 also have a huge demographic as well. If you look at Blink-182's demographic, it began with sort of like kids age 10 up until people in their, maybe in their mid-20s. But what's happened is as time's gone on, those people between the ages of 10 and 25 are now between the ages of maybe 28 and 43. So there's a bigger demographic up here and there's a newer demographic of younger fans who are also teenagers. So they have this huge demographic. It's not like bands like Five Seconds of Summer. Bands like Five Seconds of Summer and also pop bands like One Direction, they have a main demographic. It's like 13 to 25 year olds. Whereas Blink-182 don't have that. They have this huge fan base of dedicated people who show up to their shows in these huge arenas. I think the reason that Blink-182 fans are so crazy and so defensive is because Blink-182 are just so relatable. If you think about it, they aren't rock stars. I mean, they are rock stars, but they don't act like rock stars. They just act like funny, goofy, cool guys. They just act like down to earth, normal, funny, goofy guys. And I think this really contributed to their major success 20 to 25 years ago because people were watching their music videos and they were watching them on MTV and TRL. And they're not seeing these rock stars. They're seeing people who are similar to them, guys just dressed in surfer clothes and skater clothes or streetwear, hanging out and having fun and writing just simple, good, catchy sing-along songs and really having a great time and showing everyone a great time at their show. So Blink-182 are relatable. Sum 41, on the other hand, extremely, extremely talented musicians. They're not as relatable in that sense. They are a little bit, but when you watch their show, you're just like, wow, these guys are just incredible musicians. It's not as relatable as it is to people. When, when you're looking at Blink-182, you're kind of just looking at a bunch of guys who you almost feel like you could hang out with them. You almost feel like you know them on a personal level. Everyone likes them and they just seem like really funny guys. They don't act like rock stars. They don't act arrogant. They're just these regular cool guys from San Diego who happened to form a band and it went on to become very successful due to their songwriting talents and they're relatable and just that they seem really cool and fun. And you know, I love Sum 41. I think that they seem really cool and fun as well. They just don't have that relatability. But like I said, they've built this incredible fan base and we love them no matter what they do. They could put out the worst album ever it, they could literally put an album out of them just like hitting bins with their guitar. I would still go to their concert, even if like, you know, they play five songs from that bin guitar album, I'm still gonna enjoy the other 12 to 15 they play from all their other albums, right? We dedicated fan base. And I think that's really just a wonderful thing. And look, I'm not saying one is better or worse. I'm not saying that Sum 41 are crap and Blink-182 are amazing. And I'm not saying it the other way around. I'm not saying Blink-182 are terrible musicians who got lucky and that Sum 41 are, you know, are really hard done by. They, you know, they, they got slept on basically. It's strange that Sum 41 aren't bigger because, you know, they do have all these traits. They are talented songwriters. They are relatable, they are cool guys, they have amazing hits, they, they've had a really, really incredible career. And hey, if I was in a band, and that band was like headlining Brixton Academy and selling it out, and selling out international tours, and playing at festivals all the time, and making you know millions of dollars in revenue from both album sales and streams and concerts, yeah, obviously they're extremely successful. It's not me bashing on either band, it's not me comparing bands, it's just me analyzing 
why isn't this band as big as this other one in the commercial sense of the word? Guys, I hope you've enjoyed that breakdown. I had a lot of fun putting it together. If you could please hit the subscribe button for more of these music talky videos. Uh, I'm gonna be doing more of these music style sort of breaking down genres and breaking down bands and all this kind of stuff. I was doing drum covers for a while, but I wanna make my channel more of like a music-y sort of channel, especially as I spent you know, years studying music at both college and university, and I really enjoy it. It's such a passion project of mine. So if you could hit that subscribe button, comment down below what you thought of that video and any other subjects you'd like me to talk about, that would be amazing. Guys, I will see you in the next video.